Hello everybody, welcome back to another session by K21 Academy and today we will be discussing about some of the top interview questions of AWS Solution Architect. So watch the video till the end to have all the deeper insights of the kind of questions that you will be asked in your upcoming interview season. So let's get into the video. The first question is how terminating and stopping an instance are different processes. Okay, so we know instances perform a regular shutdown when it's stop. It perform transitions as the entire EBS volumes remain present. It is possible to start the instance anytime again when you want. The best thing is when the instance remain in stop state, user don't need to pay for the particular time, right? Upon terminations, the instance perform a regular shutdown. After this, the Amazon EVS volume start deleting. You can stop them from deleting simply by setting the delete on termination to false because the instance gets deleted. It's not possible to run it again in the future. So this is the difference from terminating a stance and stopping an instance. Moving to our next question that says when there's a need to acquire cost with an EIP. So EIP stands for Elastic Internet Protocol Address. The cost acquired with an EIP when the same is associated and allocated with stopped instance. In case only one elastic IP is there with the instance you are running, you will not be charged for it. However, in case the IP attached to a stopped instance or does not attach to any instance, you need to pay for it. Coming to next question that says, what is the difference between an on-demand instance and a spot instance? Spot instances is similar to bidding and the price of bidding is known as spot price. Both spot and on-demand instances are pricing models. The advantage of spot instance is that they are cost effective and drawback is that they can terminate anytime. If the spot price become more than the bid price, then the instance can go away anytime and terminate it within two minutes of notice where on-demand instances are made available whenever you require them and you need to pay for the time you use them on an hourly basis. These instances can be released when they are no longer required and do not require any upfront commitment. The availability of these instances is guaranteed by AWS unlike spot instances. Moving to our next question, name the instances type of which multi-AZ deployments are available. The answer for this question is very simple. The multi-AZ deployment are simply available for all the instances irrespective of their types and use. Moving to our next question, which instance can be used for deploying a four node cluster of Hadoop in Amazon Web Service? It is possible to use i2 large and C4.8x large instances for this. However, C4BX needs a better configuration on the PC. At same stages, you can simply launch the EMR, which is Elastic Map Reduce for automatic configuration of the servers for you. Data can be put into S3 and EMR is able to pick it from there. It will load your data in S3 again after processing it. So the next question says, what do you know about an AMI? So AMI is generally considered as a template of virtual machines. While starting an instance, it is possible to select pre-backed AMIs that AMIs commonly have in them. However, not all AMI are available to use free of cost. It is also possible to have customized AMI and the most common reasons to use the same is nothing but saving the space on Amazon Web Service. This is done in case a group of software is not required and AMI can simply be customized in that situation. Now the question number seven says, is it possible to run multiple websites on EC2 server with one elastic IP? So the answer for this question is no, it is not possible. We need more than one elastic IP if we are running multiple websites on the EC2 servers. So the next question is what are the states available in processor state control? So let me tell you there are two stages. The first one is P state. It has different level of starting from P0 to P15 
P0 represents the highest frequency and P15 represents the lowest frequency. The next one is C state. This level are from C0 to C6 where C6 is the strongest state for processor. It is possible to customize these states in few EC2 instances which enable users to customize processor as per their need. Moving to our next question, why do you go for making the subnets? So the answer for these question is effectively utilize networks which can be a large number of hosts. You can assume there are many networks that come up with many large number of hosts. It helps in managing the host for giving a tremendous job. For easy access, the network gets divided into subnets. These will help in managing the host and getting it into a very simpler form. The next question in the list, can you use Amazon CloudFront in directing the transfer objects? Definitely it is a yes. The Amazon CloudFront will help you in supporting through the customer's origins. This may include the origin that can come from outside of AWS. When you come in contact with the direct AWS, then you will be getting charged for the respective data that is needed for transfer. Next question says, is it possible to speed up data transfer in Snowball? If yes, then how? So the answer for this question is yes. It is possible. There are certain methods for this. First is simply copying from different host to the same snowball. Another method is by creating a group of similar files. This is helpful as it cut down the encryption issues. Data transfer can also be enhanced by simply copying operations again and again at same time provided by workstations and is capable to bear the load. The next one is is it possible to establish a connection between Amazon Cloud and corporate data centers? Yes, it is possible. For this, first a virtual private network is to be established between the virtual private cloud and the organization's networks. After this, the connection can simply be created and data can be accessed reliably. Moving to our next question, why it is not possible to change or modify the private IP address of an EC2 instance when it is running? So this is because of private IP remains the instance permanently or through the life cycle. Thus it cannot be changed or modified. However, it is possible to change the secondary private address. The next question says, is it possible to run multiple databases for Amazon RDS free of cost? Yes, it is possible. There's a direct upper limit of 750 hours of users post which everything will be billed as per RDS prices. In case you exceed the limit, you will be charged only for the extra hours beyond 750. So the next question is, if you hold half of the workload on the public cloud, whereas different half on local storage, in such cases, what type of architecture can be used? So in such cases, the hybrid cloud architecture can be used because the hybrid cloud is a mixture of public cloud and as well as private cloud. Our next question in the list is what is hypervisor? So let me tell you guys, a hypervisor is a type of software used to create a run virtual machine. It integrates physical hardware resources into a platform which are distributed virtually to each user. Hypervisor includes Oracle Virtual Box, VM Fusion, VM Workstations, etc. Now coming to a bit advanced questions. So the question is, I have some private servers on my premises. I also have distributed some of my workload on public cloud. What is the architecture called? This type of architecture would be a hybrid cloud. Why? Because we are using both the public cloud and your on premise servers that is private cloud. It would not be better if your private and public cloud were all on the same network. This is established by including the public cloud servers in a virtual private cloud and connecting this virtual cloud with your on prem servers using a VPN, which is a virtual private network. Moving to our next question. What does the following command do with respect to Amazon EC2 security groups? The command is here. A security group is just like a firewall. It controls the traffic in and out of your instance. In AWS terms, it is inbound or outbound traffic. The command mention is pretty straightforward. It says create security group and does the same. Moving along, once your security group is created, you can add different rule in it. 
For example, you have an RDS instance to access it. You have to add the public IP address for the machines from which you want to access the instance in its security group. Now moving to our next question. If I want my instance to run on single tenant hardware, which value do I have to set in instance tenancy attribute to? According to these options, the instant tenancy attribute should be set on dedicated instance because the rest of the values are invalid. Okay, the next question in the list. If my AWS direct connect fails, will I lose my connectivity? As an answer, if a backup AWS direct connect has been configured, in the event of a failure, it will switch over the second one. It is recommended to enable bidirectional forwarding detection which is BFD when configuring your connection to ensure faster detection and failover. On other hand, if you have configured a backup IPsec VPN connection instead, all VPC traffic will fail over to the backup VPN connection automatically. Traffic to or from public resources such as Amazon S3 will be routed over the internet. If you do not have backup AWS Direct Connect link to a IPsec VPN link, then Amazon VPC traffic will be dropped in event of a failure. We have especially curated this learning path for AWS Engineer and Certified Solutions Architect. So if you are somebody who wants to start from beginning and go to the advanced level, then this is the perfect roadmap for you. Day one, we'll be discussing about introduction to cloud and AWS. On day two, we'll be talking about how to create AWS free tier account, billing alarms. We'll also be having some labs so that you can perform well and practice your hands on. Day three, we'll be talking about security management of AWS, under which we'll be discussing about creating API keys for accessing AWS services. And we'll also be having labs so that you can perform and practice and get hands on. Day four, we'll be talking about object storage options. On day fifth, we'll be talking about designing computing environment. On day six, we'll be talking about load balancer, auto scaling and route 53, under which we'll discuss about elastic load balancer, application versus network versus gateway, load balancer, load balancer troubleshoot and followed by some labs. Day seven, we'll be talking about auto scaling and life cycle, route 53, routing policies and some labs. Under day 8, we'll be talking about networking and monitoring services. Day 9th, we'll be discussing about database server and analytics. On day 10th, we will be talking about application and messaging services. Day 11th, we'll be talking about configuration management and automation followed by labs as well so that you can have a best practice of hands-on. Day 12th talks about architecture in AWS. Day 13, we'll be talking about machine learning, under which we'll be talking about recognition, transcribe, poly and transcribe, comprehend, SageMaker, forecast and Kendra, and Textract. Day 14th, we'll be discussing about your exam preparation, tips and resources for clearing the certification, and followed by some sample practice tests. On day 15th, we will be talking about real-time project discussions that how to deploy web application, provisioning certificates using AWS Certificate Manager, build WordPress websites, Amazon EC2 auto scaling with EC2 spot instances. And on day 16th, we will be talking about your CV preparation, interview questions, and we'll be helping you in on job support. So if you're somebody who wants to have a deeper dive, then we have something really special for you. We have our free class on AWS Solutions Architect certification and a higher paid job for beginners along with a demo. So if you want to have access to this free class, then just visit k21academy.com forward slash AWS SA02. You'll be seeing this kind of interface. Just click on book your free seat now. Select an event date according to your availability, add your name, your email address, your phone number and click on yes, save my seat. Moving ahead, you'll be seeing this kind of link on the extreme right. Save this link, add it to your calendars and I'll see you in the free class. Till then, keep learning.